Welcome to Seminars at Seaport. I'm Joella West, Seminars Chair. This is the fifth and final event of our 2020 season. We always anticipate an interesting season, but this one exceeded expectations in so many ways. Thank you all for taking the online journey with us. Thank you for your donations in this time when there are so many compelling needs. If you decide that you would like to make a contribution during this talk, you can do so by clicking on the light green bar at the bottom of your screen. Or really, at any time, by going to our website, seminars at steamboat.org slash donate. Thanks to our board for choosing to go forward in a new way this season. And special thanks to three people, Ken Spruill and Jenny Ray, who said, we can do this. And they did. And our executive director, Jeff Metcher, who truly does everything at all hours throughout the year. Thanks also to KUNC Northern Colorado Public Radio for promoting our season and for making each of our talks available for listeners at KUNC.org slash seminars. Later this month, we'll begin the planning process for 2021. Planning is always challenging as we assess potential nonpartisan public policy issues that we believe will be compelling a year in the future. Part of this process is understanding what you, our audience, think about. And part of the reason we can do that is the results of our annual audience survey. This week, each of you will be receiving our online one-page questionnaire. Please take a moment to complete it. Your answers really do make a difference in the choices we make. We look forward to seeing you all next July. In person, we hope, here at Steamboat. But one way or another, we'll be presenting another great season. So keep in touch. You can always find us at seminars at steamboat.org, where you can view talks from this season and from past ones, which stay surprisingly relevant. This summer's talks will also continue to be available for viewing on Crowdcast Seminars at Steamboat. You can order a copy of tonight's speaker's most recent book at steamboatbooks.com. They will insert an author signed book plate with your purchase. Thank you to today's supporting sponsors, Alan and Susan Kirkpatrick, and one anonymous supporting sponsor. A final thanks to all of the sponsors and supporting sponsors of each of our events this season, and to Bell Sawhill and Yampa Valley Community Foundation, whose contributions helped bring you this entire season. As you listen today, submit any questions for our speaker by clicking at the bottom of your screen. Tonight's speaker is Kathleen Hall Jameson, and here to introduce her is former board chair Bob Stein. Thank you, Joella. It's my pleasure to welcome Kathleen Hall Jameson back to seminars. She was here in 2017 discussing fact-checking, fake news in the roles of the press. Not unrelated, her talk this year, Cyber Hacking in the 2020 Election, builds on her previous work and is also the subject of her newest book that Joella mentioned, Cyber War, which in its expanded and revised paperback version, as she said, is available through Off the Beaten Path. Uh, Kathleen is also the founder of factcheck.org and Science Check. As cyber continues to insinuate itself into more and more of our lives, we accept it for its good uses, but hackers, trolls, bots, all words which have new meanings have created disruptions that we can assume will continue to grow. and. Just this past week, we read that apparently the Chinese and Russians by their cyber actions are taking sides in the election. Kathleen, the director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center and award-winning author is the perfect person to walk us through what we don't, can't, and do know about cyber war and what we can and can't do about it, and how cyber will be used or misused in the 2020 election. Kathleen. 
Thank you, Bob. It's so good to be back with you. Uh, Bob and I, that is my Bob and I, uh, treasure our memories of being with you last time. And our grandson, our grandson still has his steamboat fossils. So if he turns out to be a, ge a geologist, we're going to give you direct credit. When I was with you last time, I wasn't even thinking about writing this book because I had no reason to believe that there was anything particularly untoward or any influence on the 2016 election. Uh, the realization that something might be afoot occurred as I was watching television, watching the hearings uh, in which the platforms came forward to discuss what they had found online of Russian troll activities. Uh, that is cyber warriors pretending to be us and trying to manipulate what we were seeing online. And then I remembered that I had data from 2016 that I couldn't really explain, which looked as if something that was a really strong signal to the electorate was happening in October and early November. And upon reflection, realized that that strong signal in our polling data was consistent with a hacking effect that created a news media agenda change that would have affected attitudes, not significantly, but on the margin against Hillary Clinton. And when communication effects occur in elections, they're usually not big effects. They're usually quick effects. They usually dissipate pretty rapidly, but they're more likely to occur when you have an electorate that has more undecided voters than usual, fewer anchored tightly to party, both, both situations we had in 2016, and when people aren't really satisfied with either one of their choices as they remain undecided in the final weeks. That's exactly a situation in which an imbalance in messages can make a difference online or in media contact, hack media contact, change where the change media agenda affects what we're thinking about. And as we think about different topics as we're considering to vote, we can actually, if we're undecided, shift for or against a candidate because we may have now prioritized a topic that disadvantages one candidate and advantages the other. So that's my explanation in cyber war about the ways in which the Russian trolls in social media, and probably not to a great extent, they weren't clearly able to target well enough. But the Russian hackers through Julian Assange and through WikiLeaks were able to adjust the press agenda to create those message imbalances that created a disadvantage for Hillary Clinton. And I'm gonna show you some of how that worked. But I'm gonna focus more on what that tells us about we, what we could be seeing in 2020 and not trying to make the case, and I think I could make it, and I think I've made it in the book, that it probably affected the outcome of the election in 2016. And there's a third argument sitting in the book, which I'm not going to treat here, which if Russian disinformation was also at play, in addition to the trolls, and I don't think they had a substantial impact, and the hackers, hackers and I think they did through the press, mediated by Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, Russian disinformation may have influenced James Comey's decision to make public the, the awareness, public awareness of the reopen investigation of the Wiener laptop. So that's basically the structure of the book. Trolls impact, probably not great. Hackers, probably significant enough to make a difference. And then if there's this Comey disinformation, well, that may have mattered. Let me then go back and try to reprise what I've got inside the argument about 2016 and beyond, Gary, if you'll dance the slides. So next slide, please. So what we know from the Mueller report is that what we had was sweeping and systematic efforts. You're seeing some of the statistics on the screen. That's pretty wide reach. Look at the reach of the hackers through the number of items disseminated. Look at the reach of the trolls. Next. We also know that they were all over the place. They were on RT, which is an overt channel, Sputnik, which is an overt channel. In fact, I've got RT in my living room right now because it's carried on my cable stations. And I used to see it in hotel rooms a lot as I was moving around the country. And I just saw RT, I didn't think Russia today, although if you watch closely, you can detect the spin underlying what they're characterizing as news. And secondly, there were the trolls. Those are the cyber marauders in social media, the hackers who worked through Julian Assange and WikiLeaks ultimately to get to the American electorate through our news media, and then the Democracy RIP campaign, hashtag Democracy RIP, which among other things breached our electoral structures. And I'm gonna talk about that toward the end because we know that some of that's already happening now. And then where do we go beyond? So that's my preview, next slide. So let's look at what you see on the screen. What you see on the screen is RT. And RT is in the process of communicating to you about everything from vaccination to in the case of the 2016 election, making the argument that it wasn't the Russians who were behind the hacking. It was a DNC staff member who tragically was killed early morning in DC. And conveniently, 
the Russians and others made the argument that, no, he'd done the hacking and he'd leaked the content. So deflection away from the Russian source. And in public space, this was overt. This was on RT. Next. Trolls. The trolls were all over the place. They were in social media all over the place, and they were leveraging RT and Sputnik by trying to direct traffic to them. So when people just say Facebook and Twitter, yes, those were big players, and so was Instagram, but there were all sorts of other places as well. And among other places, they had a video game up in which you could play the role of Hillary Clinton uh, dropping illicit emails and casting away the Constitution. Next. So some troll accounts were very successful. Now we're in cyberspace. Among others, the one that was trying to appeal to black voters actually had more traffic than the Black Lives Matter site inside the United States. Next. The content magnified fears of cultural change. And I'm just showing you some examples here. This is just classic sowing unrest. It's also trying to aggregate an audience by finding what kind of people like and share through matching of identities the trolls would better know how to target those individuals who are subject to persuasion. Evocative images, evocative words, quick likelihood that if you already share the sentiment, you'll share with others and provide a cue that helps the trolls direct their content more effectively. Next slide. The content also is pretty pernicious at some points, but much of it looks very much like what's already circulated within social media. They hijacked more content than they created in original form. And they targeted voters of interest to Trump, which surprised me, and it was the impetus for writing the book, was realizing when the platform started showing us the content that there was a theory of the election under that, and the theory was sound. That is, Donald Trump needed to mobilize evangelicals and veterans. He needed to demobilize black voters. And where possible, he needed to shift young liberals and Sanders supporters who were disaffected with Hillary Clinton to Stein. So how did they know to do that? When I first put the book together, I explicitly said there didn't have to be cooperation between the Trump campaign and the Russians for them to have figured this out. All they really had to do was read our you know, U.S. media because our coverage is so tactical that if you read it carefully, you know what states to target and what voters to target and what the needs of the two campaigns are. Once you know that, all you have to do is create message imbalances that increase the likelihood that people are featuring one facet of the argument rather than others, and that would shift votes on the margin. So first, let's look at some content. Here's how they mobilized evangelicals and veterans, or attempted to. Okay, just scroll through. Now notice, these are pretty classic, straightforward political appeals. Some of it's some of this highly whimsical. Next. Veterans. Next. Demobilizing black voters. Next. Allegation that Bill Clinton fathered an illegitimate child with a black prostitute. And now we're getting into active vote suppression. So now what we have are appeals to do things that if you do them, will cancel out your vote. You can't text your vote. You've got, you've got to submit it on a regular ballot. And what you have there is harnessing a celebrity who was engaged in active voter mobilization, taking that person's image and then putting the suppressive appeal over it. And here's our last category, shifting young liberal to Sanders supporters. So what we've got is choose peace and vote for Jill Stein. Trust me, it's not a wasted vote. The only way to make our country come back or to take our country back is to stop voting for corporations and banks that own us. That's a pretty good mimicry of a standard appeal to vote for Jill Stein. Next. What we see is if you search RT and Sputnik, you find a whole lot of content that's favorable to Jill Stein. And here's one of their direct ads. Next. Who is Jill Stein? Why would they want to support Jill Stein? Well, it doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, after all, it'd make more sense to shift to the libertarians. They've got a bigger base. But Stein and the Russians seem to have a lot in common. They were already promoting her and her views on RT and Sputnik. And here she is in a famous photo. You probably remember it because there's Michael Flynn at the same dinner. There's Vladimir Putin 
and there's Jill Stein. This is the 10th anniversary of RT. Next slide. So what we have is a troll strategy that was consistent with the electoral needs of Donald Trump. But what I learned between the first and second edition of the book, because more content became available, and we learned more about the capacity to target, was they didn't really have enough content that was targeting these groups. And it didn't have enough dispersal into the places that they needed to reach in order to shift the margin enough to account for the difference. You'd have to drop Hillary Clinton's vote nationally by 1% in order to have three decisive states at the end make a difference by 78,000 votes. And the trolls just simply couldn't do that. But did they create some small effect? It's certainly possible. What's of interest here though is not that, but it's a preview of what's to come. Notice they were harnessing existing content. They were amplifying what was already in news channels. They were trying to shift messages. They were trying to create message imbalances. That's one of the things we should look for. Not necessarily content that screams Russia, 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 because it didn't, but rather imbalances that are highly targeted. Well, the problem is that just looks like campaigning in the United States, and it makes it extremely difficult to detect. So we're going to catch trolls, probably because the platforms are going to recognize the structures by which they get the messaging in and out, monitor them carefully enough for their inauthenticity, and shut them down before we ever make any decisions about the content itself. But second category, hackers, here we know they were successful thanks to Julian Assange WikiLeaks in the U.S. press. Let me make that case. Next slide, please. Our press had a lot of failures in 2016, and I don't mean to badmouth the press because they did a lot of things that were good. But they were just overwhelmed by Russian content, Russian hacked content. It became Russian traffic content stolen from the Democrats. So first, after summer, they failed to source content to Julian Assange and the Russians. And then on October 7th, they downplayed or ignored the October 7th confirmation that the Russians were behind the hacking. And what's important about that day is that's the day in which the Access Hollywood tape is released. So the news media had three things on their agenda that day. First, the intelligence agencies had confirmed it was the Russians behind the first tranche of hacking, the summer hacking. Secondly, Access Hollywood tape. And then, boy, that wasn't a coincidence. The hacked Podesta content is released. That created an equivalence news frame over that weekend that probably saved the Trump candidacy. We know from Woodward's book that inside the Republican High Command, they were basically suggesting that maybe Trump should step aside, let Pence move to the top of the ticket and put Condoleezza Rice in as the person who would be second on the Republican ticket. That's pretty serious discussion at that point. And there were people advising Donald Trump that basically he wanted to save his brand, perhaps for the good of the country, he ought to step aside. Well, he didn't need to in an environment in which Access Hollywood wasn't the only story because the Russian hacked content was there and it created an equivalence frame in which the question was, well, what did each one of them say or do in private as opposed to say or do in public? As a result, a major effect for that hacked content was creating that equivalence frame at the point at which Donald Trump was the most vulnerable during the election cycle. Reporters also failed to note the lack of independent verification of the hacked content. Now, in fairness to them, the Clinton campaign never disputed its accuracy. They just wouldn't confirm whether or not it was accurate. But nonetheless, the journalistic norm says before you traffic something into the press, indicate whether you've independently verified, and they hadn't. And this is going to be important to an argument I'm going to make in a moment. When because the press lost track of the fact that they hadn't independently verified, and because the hacked content was not being attributed to the hacking, but to WikiLeaks, it wasn't being subjected to the tests of newsworthiness that the reporters would have subjected it to had, and grant me the hypothetical for the moment, somebody in Russia picked up the phone and said, hello, this is a person from Russia who's working for the Kremlin, and I would like you to run a story about material we just stole from John Podesta's email or from the DNC. Now, under those circumstances, the reporter would not have put that material in news without looking at it really, really carefully and asking, was it being tactically released? Was it being released selectively? Why are they releasing it? What is their motives? But if it's WikiLeaks, not Russian hacked content, and if it's a leaked, not hacked, and leaked, not illegally gotten, then reporters aren't going to be as conscious of newsworthiness, and they're not going to have that test in place as clearly. And I argue in the book, there are a number of instances in which what they pushed into news that got news coverage doesn't justify the play it got based on its actual newsworthiness. But secondly, they were less likely to ask whether they were taking things out of context. 
because they weren't highly conscious of the source. Russian hacked the mediation. Julian Assange, Julian Assange had said he didn't want Hillary Clinton elected and that it was illegally gotten, hacked, not leaked. So hacked content altered the media agenda and next claim. And at key moments, reporters took hacked content out of context. Now, why does this matter? If you're changing the news agenda, just simply by creating imbalances, that of itself in a close election can shift close votes. But let's look at the extent to which that happened. Here's the argument for hacked content affected the media agenda. These are headlines, headlines referencing WikiLeaks, not Russian hacked content, not Julian Assange, WikiLeaks. And this is by outlet. Now you see conservative outlets there, you'd expect that, but you see the Washington Post and New York Times there too, and those aren't small numbers. Next slide. Here are your Google Trends. What happened to Access Hollywood? That's the low blue line. What happened to the quote unquote WikiLeaks content? That's that top line. And Julian Assange was clever. He kept dropping new tidbits of hacked content out week by week by week by week. So he kept spiking new interest in new stories all the way through the election. Next slide. What did the press do? Well, after the fact, here are some admissions from the press. The overhyped coverage of the hacked emails was the media's worst mistake in 2016, one sure to be repeated if not properly understood. And that's actually my theme this afternoon because I want to understand it so we can watch for it so our press will not repeat the mistakes it made. Next slide. How did the press respond? This is Amy Chozik in her book, uh, Chasing Hillary. I didn't argue that it appeared the emails were stolen by a hostile foreign government that had staged an attack on our electoral system. I didn't push to hold off on publishing them until we could have a less hairy discussion. I didn't raise the possibility we'd become puppets in Putin's shadowy campaign. I chose the byline. I agree with her. They did. Next. And also, how did the press respond? This is the Pulitzer Prize winning team from the New York Times after the fact. Every major publication, including the Times, published multiple stories citing the DNC and Podesta emails posted by WikiLeaks becoming a de facto instrument of Russian intelligence. Had it not been for the inadvertent complicity of the press, the hacking could not have had what I argue is its effect on the media agenda and, I surmise from our polling data, an effect also on enough votes to have shifted the margin in favor of Donald Trump. Next. At key moments, reporters also took hacked content out of context. Next. Here's what the actual WikiLeaks content says. My dream is hemispheric common market with open trade and open borders sometime in the future with energy that is as green and sustainable as we can get it, powering growth and opportunity for every person in the hemisphere. Notice that my dream is a hemispheric common market with open trade and open borders is highly qualified by the rest of that sentence. Sometime in the future, the referent is energy. It's green and sustainable, powering growth and opportunity for every person in the hemisphere. Did she come out in closed doors and secretly whispered to big bankers, my dream is a hemispheric common market with open trade and open borders? Or did she say even, I stand for open trade and open borders? No. She's setting up a whole series of qualifications at about a specific area. Next slide. Here's what happens when that content goes on to ABC. This is the Sunday after the hack content is released. It's also the Sunday, October 9th of the, of the debate. Okay, ABC keeps it in context. Good for ABC. So far, hooray press. Next. Here's Face the Nation. Notice the period. Next. Here's CNN. Well, at least they put in ellipses. Next. Here's Fox News. This is Chris Wallace's show. These are, by the way, all reporters whom I admire greatly. I just think they were caught up in the moment and didn't go back to check. And here what Fox News does is then takes the content with the ellipses and puts adjoining to it content that does not adjoin it at all in the original source. It's pages away. Next. So what happens in the third debate? Chris Wallace in the third debate premises his question on the assumption that we learned from WikiLeaks, not the Russians, not Russian hack content, not material gotten to us through Julian Assange, not illegally gotten content, content, but WikiLeaks that you said, and I want to quote, my dream is the hemispheric common market with open trade and open borders. It's problematic for Hillary Clinton because open trade and open borders was for Donald Trump a type 
Donald Trump a digestive statement. He had digested his claims against her. And she was vulnerable on trade because she switched her position on trade. On open borders for Donald Trump, it stood for refugees flooding in, illegal immigrants flooding in, no bounds at the borders. Hillary Clinton denied throughout the election that that was her position. And she didn't say in that private setting that it was either remember what the context was. But in the course of the debate, when she gets is faced with this and she responds by saying, but that's not what I said. I said, and then fills out the rest of the statement, she sounds disingenuous. First, most people have not looked at the hacked content to see what the context was. Secondly, the news up to that point had framed it that way. So you believe she's not representing what's reality. You've actually heard what the reality was from that other news. And the moderator has also told you that that's not reality because he said, and I quote, and his voice puts a period there. He doesn't say dot, 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 dot. Next. So a piece of the, the Russian plan was to discredit the Clinton presidency. But before we get there, notice they didn't think all this stuff was going to have an effect that would affect the outcome. They had a plan to delegitimize the election. And now we're in transition to ask what's going to come next. Next slide. Now, hashtag democracy RIP. Hashtag democracy RIP was lurking inside the Russian streams up to that point, And this is what it looked like. Next slide. They breached electoral infrastructures. And here's the question. I know some of you come from the intelligence community. Do you think they left their fingerprints there so that we would find that our electoral structure had been breached? Well, they didn't actually change votes. We don't know whether they did or did not. We don't know. We don't think that they did based on what we have, but we don't know whether they did. But to some extent, it doesn't matter because if we know that it could be breached, they could have, and now you can call the legitimacy of our electoral structure into question. And they don't run the risk that someone says, you changed votes, that's a violation of national sovereignty, and as a result says, this was actually an act of war. I know there's controversy about my use of cyber war because some of the intelligence community want to delimit that, that definition of that word so it doesn't encompass actions in cyberspace and hacking and the like. But I would argue at the point at which they touch our infrastructure, that's for me the equivalent of touching what we usually think of as physical infrastructure. I think that's a breach of national sovereignty, as I think anything that breaches the electoral structure is, a, is in practice a natural breach of a national breach of, of national sovereignty as well. They also may have been trying to place malware. Now here I'm way out on a hook, but I'm going to show you a headline in a moment next. They activated, they were ready to activate, they were in the process of activating a troll campaign alleging voter irregularities and fraud. Next. And they had insinuated sleeper personae alleging irregularities into mainstream news that actually had succeeded in doing this on election night before they realized the outcome was their candidate had won. Next. So let's look at planning sides, signs that the electoral infrastructure had been breached. This is some fine reporting uh, that notes that the FBI and DHS assessed that Russian government cyber actors probably conducted research and reconnaissance against all U.S. states' election networks leading up to the 2016 presidential elections. I know many of you are from the Washington community. Look at how long it took us to figure that out. Are we able to figure it out in real time? Well, the information we just got last week said they think they're at it again. Next. We also know that in an apparent move to embarrass the United States, Russia sought to send monitors to U.S. polling stations. Now, that could simply be classical propaganda. You come and monitor elections all over the world, you high-handed United States. We're going to show you your elections aren't, aren't really that well protected either. But it's also possible, since our elections are very decentralized, that someone there was thinking about planting some malware. And if you planted some malware, you would increase the likelihood, not that you change enough votes to matter, but that if the malware were then discovered, you would have people doubting the legitimacy of the outcome because they wouldn't know whether the tampering had yielded vote change. Next. They activated a troll campaign. So these are trolls. These are Russian personae pretending to be us who have been active in cyberspace, who now, as you get closer to the election, are trafficking and claims that the election is rigged, offering confirmation, offering instances, trying to suggest you just can't trust it. Now, they're not making this stuff up from scratch. 
there already is a major theme in the body politics saying this is likely to happen. Candidate Trump had said if he lost Pennsylvania, it would have to have been because of vote rigging. But what you see here is setting up to make more visible the claims that you can't trust the outcome. And here's the one that interests me next. They're sleeper cells. They're, they're benign. They look like there's something else. In this case, it's a Tennessee GOP, at 10 underscore GOP. They got away for the whole general election pretending they were Tennessee Republicans. They had a higher traffic to their site than did the Tennessee Republicans. The Tennessee Republicans tried to shut them down on the grounds that they said they're not Tennessee Republicans. Well, what is um, at 10 underscore GOP doing on election day? Machine refuses to allow vote for Trump in Pennsylvania. Retweet the hell out of it. Hashtag vote frog, hashtag, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why is this interesting? Take a look at the web page underneath this. They made it onto the NBC News site website. So what if we'd had a close election on election night, a Bush v. Gore kind of situation? The trolls actually managed to get at least one success into the news stream that night to suggest that the process was a rigged process. Now, would that have made a difference in real time? Probably not, but it gives us a clue about what some of that social media capacity could do in the person of sleeper cells that just sit there and lurk, but wait until an opportune moment with their credibility built to spring allegations at the last moment. Next. So what about and beyond? Well, you could say the platforms have now put in place a lot of protections. They're shutting down inauthentic accounts. They're increasing the likelihood that you can't buy advertising if you're a foreign national. And by the way, the platform should have figured out when some of those ads were bought in Ruples that something was going on here, but most of them were not. They also now, in the form of YouTube, have a disclaimer. So if something is, is funded by a, foreign, by a foreign government, in fact, also funded in the US, PBS is carrying this disclaimer, they indicate government sponsorship. This is to heighten our awareness that we're seeing content that may have some kind of a government tie. So the platforms have taken action. The press has said, we're going to be more vigilant about how we treat hacked and leaked content. I hope they are because that was a big vulnerability for us. But what do we know about and beyond? Next. RT and Sputnik are still at it. We can watch them. I can watch them at home tonight after I say goodnight to you. We know they're engaged in social media activity. And next, we suspect that there may be hacking. And next, there's certainly hacking attempts. So what do we have? We have these kinds of confirmations. In the week that followed Donald Trump's election, Russia used its fake accounts on social media to organize a rally in New York City supporting the president-elect and another rally in New York decrying him. They didn't shut down after the election. A part of what this means is that the actions that the Obama administration took just before leaving office didn't stop their activities. Well, what happens next? Let's highlight, they're, they're involved all over the place in efforts to delegitimize our economy. So we've got a lot of success with gen genetic engineering. No surprise, Russians are trying to suggest that GMOs are just all suspect. And they're using those kinds of claims as part of an information war. Next. They're also suggesting through a Russian propaganda arm, that is Radio Sputnik, on three Kansas City radio stations, that their propaganda should be able to reach the United States. And free enterprise, it is. Next. Social media activity, next. We took a look at the ways in which the Russian troll accounts that were at that point shut down had used vaccination rhetoric throughout the period before the shutdown. And these included troll accounts that were shut down after the election was over. And what we found was they were not only trying to sow discord about vaccination, they were on both sides of the vaccination debate. They weren't just re vaccination reluctant or vaccination hesitant or anti-vax. They were pro-vax on some accounts, anti-vax on some accounts. Well, what were they doing? This has nothing to do with politics. Well, first, where are the major vaccinations produced? Interesting question if you're interested in destabilizing the U.S. production process by, de by creating doubts about the value of some of its products. But I don't think that's what was going on here. When we looked carefully, they were trying, as we argue in this article, they were trying to create a persona 
that was consistent with their political identity. And so they were using the vaccination rhetoric, either pro or anti-vaccination, to make it more likely that you'd believe they were the kind of person that, that you were supposed to think they were. So they would be anti-vax, pro-Trump, pro-vax, advancing a Democratic candidate. In order to try to create discord, they also have the pro and anti-vax content going back and forth, but there's a secondary use of it. They're trying to increase the likelihood that we think they are who they say they are instead of who they actually are. We need to watch for those kinds of uses because these kinds of things can actually create other kinds of effects, in this case, on vaccination hesitancy or vaccination use, which I might just would be highly desirable. But also, we need to look for that as a cue of what may be going on as we're trying to detect inauthentic accounts next. We also see that they were involved in spreading Russian disinformation about Ukraine. And that at least 20 fake news articles pushed over 40 suspected Kremlin backed personae across dozens of social media networks. Next. And Clint Watts, former FBI agent and information warfare expert, says it's American made. They don't need to create the fake news, it's all American made. To which I would add, they're very good at amplifying it. They're keeping a lower profile, creating online personae with smaller follower counts and more refined posts that look like they could come from a typical American. And they're piggybacking on a social media culture increasingly steeped in paranoia and distrust of government and the scientific community. When you look carefully at the troll posts in 2016, you notice they suppressed the indefinite article. Well, which language suppresses the indefinite article? They were giving you clues that they weren't thinking in English. Their posts that were taken down more recently don't have those kinds of marking cues. So in effect, what they're trying to do is they're learning to be more effective in finding source spots and amplifying content by native English speakers. And in the process, they're spinning out their own conspiracy theories. Next. Next. A trio of English language websites to spread disinformation about the coronavirus pandemic, as if we need more help you know, pushing conspiracy theories. Why does this matter? Belief in conspiracy theories predicts a reluctance to vaccinate as well as to contact trace and, interestingly, also a reluctance to take the flu shot. Next. Hacking. Next. Clicking on the interactive map, which is reality, a malware preloader will either deploy password stealing malware or send itself to the victim's email list. What does that mean? Watch out for those interactive maps. Those interactive maps can actually provide information to trolls. Next. A broad, diverse campaign of theft and influence. Accusation here to China. Next. Here are some of their themes across time. I'm just going to let you read them. They've been at this a long time. Their capacities are now greater because we've got cyber capacity behind them. We've looked at some of those last conspiracy theories. They didn't originate in Russia. They're being amplified by Russian propagandists. Those are particularly pernicious. Those are the ones we predicted from in our regressions looking at what predicts a reduced likelihood to trace, to engage in protective behaviors, to take a flu vaccine, to take the COVID vaccine. Importantly, the US responded in 2018 by hacking back. So sanctions were imposed between the beginning of the Trump administration and 2018. They continued, they, the Russians, continued their activities. The US hacked back in 2018 They've continued their activities after that. Our efforts to stop them have not been successful. Next. The threat persists. And here are the confirmations. You've read these recently. Next. And here's the report from Friday that Bob mentioned as he introduced me. Next. Next. So what can we say about Russian trolls, hackers, and hashtag democracy RIP? Let's not let them get away with making hashtag democracy RIP a reality. They gave us a blueprint. We don't want to make the mistake of fighting the last war, but that blueprint is something we ought to take seriously 
as we try to figure out how to fight this next one that we are engaged in now as we try to protect the 2020 election. I'd be happy to take your questions and your comments. Thank you, Kathleen. First, before questions, a disclaimer. I am not now, nor have I ever been related to Jill Stein. Um, I, I don't even know her. Uh, but having said that. Now, my, now isn't, isn't that what a Russian troll would say? I, I, you could ask my, my Russian grandmother. Um, let me ask a question about one of the things where we hope to get straight information, which is the presidential debates. Tom Friedman suggested that there be independent, nonpartisan fact checkers in real time uh, to check both candidates. Good idea? No. And here's the reason. The, unless you've pre-checked the claim, so you've carefully reviewed it, you know the context, it's really hazardous to fact check in real time. Remember what happened when Candy Crowley tried to fact check in real time in the Romney and a Romney Obama debate. She got it wrong and that disadvantage Mitt Romney. Now this is a good reporter. She thought she had it right. She didn't in that moment in that context. So do I favor having all of our fact checking that we can have ready in advance because people tend to repeat claims they've made before ready to deploy? Yes, I do. Do I suggest that people keep as their open screen, as they're double screening while they're watching the debate, if they're watching online, they keep open a screen that keeps fact checking content there from the fact checker of their choice, preferably factcheck.org, no cost, wonderful fact checking organization, but because that will let you in real time see things that we have pre-checked and we're sure about. But do I want someone to try to do that on the fly without having done all of that? No, because potentially they can get it wrong and they can create an inadvertent effect on the electorate that could be problematic and a close election could be consequential. Do um, the, does the fact that there's going to be more mail-in voting this year uh, have any um, influence on whether the comp they'll be more compromised or not because it is mail-in voting or does that not matter at all in terms of hacking? You know, uh, th this answer is gonna be really counterintuitive, but to the extent that we have now used a lot of electronic voting systems in our precincts, my mail-in ballot with my pencil and my hand and my paper, and if the postal service will deliver it, is more hack-proof leak proof, infrastructure proof than anything online because you can't intercept it. After it's registered, you can still play games with it once it's registered on the other end, but you've got less capacity to catch that signal in between over cyberspace. So in a bizarre sense, mail-in balloting provides Russia proofing in a way that balloting in my local, I walk down the street and there's my electronic voting booth does. We have to use. And I've got a paper trail. You've talked a lot about Russia hacking, Russia trolls, Russia cyber. What are we doing? Are we only on the defensive or do we have any active uh, offense that we are offering uh, in this area? Well, first, the one of the things that Vladimir Putin says about the whole thing as, as he winks and nods is why would the United States assume that when it's done all these sorts of things, that at some point someone wouldn't do them back? And you, he frames it as if it's a what if, but I view that as a tacit acknowledgement um, that you know he in fact did engage in those kinds of activities. The US has disrupted elections and worse historically. The arsenal that is being used here is an arsenal that the US has deployed. So to the extent that we do it, why should we be outraged when someone does it back to us? We've lost the moral high ground. The problem is people in the United States are largely unaware that the US has done it because we've been fairly clever about disguising the fact at home. It's relatively widely known abroad that we do. And there's a lovely new book whose name I wish I remembered that documents the whole history of those kinds of Russian activities. 
And uh, Bob, I'll send you a link as soon as we get up to school. I bet people in your audience already know the name. But a very fine young scholar has documented all of that inside the U.S. history with other nations, and then also documented up the relationship with Russia. Uh, so you know, we're in a situation in which the the capacities are now there on all sides. And one of the things I think we ought to think about is whether we should do what we did during the, the nuclear age and ask whether now that we have nuclear capacities on both sides in cyberspace, and that's a metaphor, should we engage in a treaty that says we'll all stand down? And should we engage in a treaty among the democratic nations of the world to say an attack on one is an attack on all? So if you attack one of us, and we are promising now we're not going to do this, then we will all impose prohibitive kinds of sanctions and penalties. Um, I think it's time to think about that. Um, there was word in one media channel and I could not find follow-up. So you're, you know, those in the Washington community may know much more about this than I do, that suggested that the Russians had reached out saying that they were interested in such a treaty and been rebuffed. I don't know whether that's true or not. That takes away another question I was gonna ask. Uh, but is our government and our other governments thinking of some kind of international agreement to deal with cyber? The, if they are, it hasn't broken into the kinds of channels that I follow. Um, but there is a very interesting piece of legislation. It's bipartisan. I think it's Rubio and Van Hollen, um, which is attempting. It's going nowhere, by the way, which is unfortunate, which is attempting to set up structure in which you, you basically say, if anybody does engages in this and we can confirm it, um, the financial penalties are going to be extraordinary. And an incumbent president will not be able to take them back. You'll have to have multiple elections in which that country is certified as not having done it again in order to get those things rolled back. Um, I think that kind of acknowledge upfront what is we're going to do. Everybody gets committed and make it fail safe. So if your candidate wins, your candidate can't roll it back is a solution short of getting international treaty. I'm, it's not my field to talk about treaties, so I may, I may be way off base on thinking a treaty is a good idea, but it sure looks like a good idea to me. Uh, our president um, has said at some time in the past uh, that he could shoot someone in Central Park and get away with it, and that was true. But if that's the case, uh, do his supporters care that there is Russian meddling? Well, first, the, the question is, for, uh, think for a moment like the president of the United States, like Donald Trump. He, I, I think to the extent that you can understand the way in which he approaches this topic, he believes that if you say there was Russian intervention, you are also saying he is an illegitimate president. And so he has argued that the whole thing is a hoax. And he was very hesitant, very, very hesitant across time to even admit that it happened. So the first thing you have to get, do is, is to think from the perspective of a supporter of a candidate who has suggested that the intelligence agency didn't get it right. And that to the extent that all of this happened, it was an attempt to ensure that he couldn't be elected. If you believe those kinds of things, then you are less likely to be concerned about it now. So the first move that I try to make when someone asks a hypothetical about what if about people who are not me is to say, how would they get to a position in which they would act in a way that doesn't seem to me to be very make very good sense? And that's how I think you get to it. And I think if you get there, the concern is that they might not be as vigilant as they would like to be if they believe the threat was real. Um, and also the, the larger point, we can't always assume that the Russians are going to intervene on one side or the other. The Russians are going to do whatever's convenient for the Russians. If we had to predict out of history which side the Russians would intervene on, um, you know, we, we would not say the Russians would try to elect a Republican. You'd say the Russians would be more likely want to historically want to elect a Democrat because of the difference in the ways in which the, the policies of those two parties historically reacted to Russia. So I hope there's a way to step back from the confusion between the coordination con con collusion argument over here and the did it happen argument over there. And I tried to say that during the whole time that I was promoting the book before and during the Mueller investigation, you can say it happened, it was real, it had plausible effects and the Trump campaign had nothing to do with producing those. Because I can get to all the knowledge they have to do what they did simply out of reading our news. And the rest of it, I can get out of what they hacked from the Democrats. They had the whole democratic playbook. 
They didn't need any help from the Trump campaign. They'd already stolen the whole Democratic playbook. They had better information on how to defeat Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump did because they had her playbook. All you have to do is flip it, create the mirror opposite, and you know how to defeat her. One of the things that you mentioned in your talk was that President Obama did respond to some of the Russian hacking, but you wrote in your book that he was afraid to go public with it because he didn't want it to be seen as a partisan way of uh, interfering with the 2016 election. Do you agree with his decision? Uh, let me step back first and say, when I, the last chapter of the book says, here are all the people who failed us. And one of those categories, you know, I would just kind of walk through all the places that things went wrong. So the platforms, the press, et cetera. Uh, but the, if, if you have to look carefully at, you know, the, the who, you know, how did they fail a scenario? You know, they, you know, go back to the way you framed your question. So now frame your question for me again, just as you said at the very end. Well, you, did, did President Obama, by not going public, again, because of the a uh, toxic political environment, if you will. Okay, um, now you now you be President Obama for me. Yeah. And now, if you're President Obama, and Mitch McConnell says I won't stand up with the Democrats and agree it's a problem. If you know we have a toxic political environment, in which people are highly polarized, what is the likelihood that if you stood up, people will say, and because we're so polarized, say he's making that up? in order to elect Hillary Clinton. The Republicans who've seen the intelligence aren't standing up with him. So now the signal from the party is he's making that up to help Hillary Clinton. So you see the machinations in the background as Harry Reid tries to make this intelligence the public as he reasonably can. You see the efforts on the part of the Democrats, the Democrat National Committee tried to get the RNC to agree to stand up on it. To the extent that the Republicans were inside polarized space and could capitalize on the polarized environment. Obama's trapped. So they, when you set up the hypothetical, if you put all the players in place and you say, now, now Kathleen, what should Obama have done? There was no good choice for Obama. And he thought Hillary Clinton was going to win. In that environment, the risk of making it public and having it discredited and having him discredited on illegitimate grounds, because it was going to be very hard to disclose the evidence that was going to make this thing plausible and real to people. And remember, we didn't even know the fellow content was there at this point. All we know is about the hacking. It's such that if I were in that situation, knowing all of those variables and thinking Hillary Clinton was going to be elected, Obama made the right decision. Now, I'm now I'm going to step back and be me, the academic. From an academic standpoint, I want an informed electorate. I want everybody to know everything that's there. I want President Obama to stand up and say, here's what we know and here's how we know it. Can he do that without compromising sources? I don't know. But I would have liked to have known clearly in the voice of the President of the United States that the Russians were behind the hacking. They didn't know about the trolls as far as I know. But he might have had the calculation that he as a result could hurt the Clinton candidacy. So it, this, it's, not, it's not an easy one to come up with the answer to the question. Well, then let me take the same question and move it forward in a way. That was the last war. But going forward, can we count on the government to do anything to oppose Russian trolls? Or as you've said, is it up to the media and are they up to the task? Well, the trolls are going to, the people are going to have to handle the trolls or the platforms. Um, and then we as citizens are going to have to be vigilant about what we share. Uh, the people who are going to have to handle the hackers um, are largely the media because they, the, the leaked, hacked content, if there is some, will gain its effect. The, the, the political players will probably use it, although I believe Joe Biden has said he wouldn't. But uh, the, the political players, are, I believe, are likely to use it. Surrogates are likely to use it if candidate is not likely to use it. And I believe Donald Trump has said he would be willing to use it. So in that kind of an environment, you know, what's our protection? Our protection is at least the mass media, to the extent that it still has influence, can critique it, be, be look at its strategy, source it relentlessly. And the question is, does it still have the power to create a countervailing influence to what's going to be happening in all of the other political space and all of what's going to be happening on social media? And I think that's an open question. If we were back 15 years ago, when the networks and mainstream news still had a huge amount of power, as opposed to a counterbalanced power, 
I would say, yes, they could of themselves minimize the likelihood and create an effect. Now, if they do everything they can, they can diminish the effect, whether they can eliminate it, I don't know. And whether you can create a backlash against it in an environment in which some will approve of its use, if they believe the content is accurate, is an even, even bigger open question. So far, you've put the burden on governments, Russia, China, Iran, but are there non-governmental actors that we have to worry about as well? In the United States, QAnon, maybe others who are putting forward on social media things which aren't exactly true. How do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, they, when I was first asked about this, the I was being interviewed by Charlie Sykes for one of his, his radio shows. Um, and this, uh, I, I hadn't even thought of any of this. And he said, Kathleen, there's, you know, there's, you know information that says there's been troll content out there. And I said, you know, what little I've looked at looks a lot like stuff that's already in, in the social media. We've already got it here. So what difference does it make? And that was a dumb answer on my part. Because what I'd forgotten about our research is message imbalances matter. And if they could get enough of it, the message imbalance could create an effect. But it doesn't mean that we should think that it is not problematic just because it comes through the United States if it is deceptive content or if it traffics in hate and fear. Much of the troll content isn't inaccurate. It's just bigoted and hatred driven. And it's trying to you know, divide us from others in the country by making us hate people who are already here, who are unlike us, and then make them hate us. So that's problematic simply because it's hard to hold a community together when you do that. It's hard to hold a country together. And it's hard to govern when you've got that kind of rhetoric out there. We ought to worry about that regardless of its source. And I run factcheck.org. My policy center runs factcheck.org. Um, Eugene Kiley actually runs factcheck.org. But we're focused on facticity, not on how do you create a climate of discourse in which one considers that kind of rhetoric inappropriate. And the closest that we've come to do something that tries to address that is with an intervention in high schools. It's called News Feed Defenders. We put it together with Justice O'Connor's iCivics project, and it asks the high school student to create her own website. And as material comes in to judge whether it's appropriate to share or not, and one of the categories you judge about whether it's fair is, is what, basically what it's going to do your whole community. It's an attempt to say there are norms of civil discourse in which we respect each other and we acknowledge each other's humanity. We acknowledge our common collective goods and our community that make us better. That's what you want on your website. And when it doesn't, you don't want that on your website. It's a move away simply from facticity into can we become better custodians of a common culture um, in which we respect each other and each other's differences? And we are, we are once again able to say, I disagree with you on philosophical grounds. You are still my good friend. Let's go have a beer. But short of calling factcheck.org, uh, when we are looking at TV, watching, uh, looking at a newspaper, how does an ordinary person uh, distinguish fact from fiction? Go to factcheck.org. First, first thing <laughs> is factcheck.org is to just check. I mean, the, the, one of the reasons that I, I mourn the erosion in audiences for traditional mainstream news, despite all of its flaws, besides its tendency to treat all campaigns as horse race contests, between its tendency to he said, she said journals, despite all of that, the best of it provides a context of understanding for the complexities of governance. And to the extent that we haven't created enough of an appetite in the electorate for it to sustain it at large scale, we as educators have failed. But can you find good, reliable information when you have a question right now about something you see in news? Yes. You go to mainstream traditional journalism, which still has as one of its categories that it's, it is engaged in self-correction. If an error is pointed out, it corrects. And one of the terms that bothers me greatly is fake news, because news can't be fake. If it's fake, it's not news. News, when error is pointed out, correct. If it doesn't do that, I won't grant it the noun news. And my alternative is viral deception. That's what we should be worried about. Deception is the noun and virality is the worry that it'll circulate within like-minded communities without gatekeepers, without trusted sources that can say, wait, that's not right. That's not actually what the person said. Or do you really want to say that about people who are different from you? Aren't they more alike than different? So you know, in that kind of an environment, we've got to figure out how we reclaim a culture.
I was going to ask about viral deception later, but um, you were you going to say VD uh, venereal disease? Did you notice? Did you notice I avoided doing that? Uh, you I, did it last time, so it I gives know. us license. <laughs> Let me go to one of the other seminars we had earlier, and we've talked a little bit about this. Uh, Admiral Stavridis said in answer to a question that there be a space force, which the president has called for, and said a cyber force, I know we have a cyber command, but a cyber force was even more important. Uh, what do you think of that? And if it is going to, if we're going to have one, what would it look like and where would it be based? Yeah, when the Department of Homeland Security was set up um, after 9 11, the, and, and they began to put functions inside the Department of Homeland Security, one of the things that remained stovepiped, a lot of different people have jurisdiction over it, was cyber. And one of the concerns with that. And I know many of the people in your audience have worked on the Hill and been active in, in legislation. One of the concerns is if every committee has jurisdiction, nobody has jurisdiction. So to the extent that we centralize an area such as cyber under some single jurisdiction, and to the extent as real that people take accountability for making sure that it's doing everything it should do, and we haven't missed anything, first, we're not going to be repeating the mistake we made before 9-11, which was let stovepiping get in the way of having agencies share information in common need. But secondly, it increases the efficiency with which we're going to respond. So to the extent that that's what a cyber force would do, um, and then also have capacities to deploy elsewhere. And I think we actually already have those capacities. We just don't call it anything. I think it's part of the covert world of government right now rather than the overt world of government. But to the extent that it is centralized, and it is, is carefully monitored with high levels of accountability inside our legislative process so that it doesn't overreach because there are no cyber geographic boundaries about where things can go. I think it would be desirable because it would be more efficient. It would minimize the likelihood that cues get lost because they've been stovepiped in places that aren't centrally accountable. You started to answer this next question before, but... I hope you could give a little more on how do you balance uh, hate or false emails, which are a result of hacking or trolls, with what we call free speech? Is it the responsibility of the media, of the um, social media sites? Who is responsible and how do you get a balance? Yeah, the, well, first, the, there, when people talk about, you know, free speech. I mean, the First Amendment is trying to protect us from government intrusion. So, you know, the, 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 we, we're now speaking about speech in a broader sense. We're, we're speaking about, you know, the, the need for democratic voice, um, the, the need for people to be able to express political points of view and to hear other, other points of view. So I, I, I really want to stay away from forms of regulation. I don't like the idea that people want the platforms to make decisions about what the platforms are going to carry, apart from information that's actively dangerous to people such as misinformation about how you should respond to COVID. When you know, the, the information is wrong, you could be making that kind of consequential decision. I want, I want to keep as much government regulation away from anything called political speech as possible. Because we know the history in, in radio, radio owners wouldn't let political parties whose candidates they oppose get any access to the airwaves. I don't want to trust somebody else to decide what I'm going to hear. Now, that may mean I hear a lot of things I don't like and a lot of things I'm uncomfortable with. But we have plenty of chances because we control our own attention to the extent that we're controlling what we put into our social media streams and we do put into our media diet and the associations we have with other people to be able to shut it out. I would like to engage it rather than shutting it out. And I'd like to know what they're saying and what they're thinking, because frankly, I'd rather know that and be prepared to deal with it than be surprised if they use it to mobilize in ways that I'm unprepared for. So I'm pretty close to being a free speech absolutist. Um, and for that reason, and, and that may just be my inherent wariness of having other people make decisions about something as consequential as speech. That said, we draw boundaries. We draw boundaries about what we should be able to see. I mean, child pornography, clear boundary. I mean, we, there are boundaries, shouting, fire, and fear, traditional boundary. We need to, to think about how we create boundaries that we enforce through forms of social disapproval that are understood in my world. So that you don't devolve toward a world in which you no longer have enough community to be able to come to common understandings 
and enough sense of a collective good that you're able to legislate. My last question, are we as a democracy uh, at a disadvantage in this ar arena over other countries which are much more authoritarian, China or Russia? Um, if you want to shut something down, it's really helpful to be an authoritarian regime. Um, our strength has always been we've had enough respect for human capacities to think that it wasn't desirable to go there um, and that we would have enough of a social fabric to be able to constrain those elements socially that are going to be problematic for us. Um, we're putting some of that to the test right now. Um, but would I rather be in one of those regimes than in the United States? Not for a not for a millisecond. And I bet the same is true of anybody that you ask. I mean, they, the with all of its flaws, this system is still the best one that's out there. And I, our job is to recognize its flaws, try to do the best we can as individuals and as groups to try to address them and be as adaptive as we can in a changing world while honoring some basic principles that are that are ethical, deeply ethical, because that's how we should be driving our own lives. Well, thank you, Kathleen. In keeping with the cyber lingo, uh, your talk deserves much more than what is called muted applause. So I will do that and <laughs> hope you can hear it. Uh, you, you've given us much to think about and also to worry about as well. Uh, the discussion, I think, is a fitting conclusion to the 2020 seminars at Steamboat's virtual year. Because we have been virtual, some of you who are listening and watching are viewers who would not normally participate in Steamboat for seminars. In the future, we hope that you will come and join us. We thank all our speakers and our entire audience, which in numbers, was greater than the fire marshal would let into the strings pavilion. And we hope that you appre appreciated not only the five timely and informative uh, seminars, but all the initial additional work that was necessary to launch a virtual series, especially to Jenny Lay and Ken Spruill of our board. Tremendous thanks for making it happen technically. Now, if you could only find a way uh, to control thunderstorms that knock out the internet, even without hackers and trolls. Tell your friends that seminars can be streamed both on Crowdcast and our website. And as uh, Joella mentioned, they are also available through our partnership with KUNC. If you registered for the seminar, as she also mentioned, you'll be getting a survey monkey survey. Please complete it. It'll help us figure out how to have at least one more year of excellent seminars. For everybody, a few final admonitions. Stay safe. Please vote in November and come back next year. <coughs> we hope we'll be able to welcome you again in person to seminars and to Steamboat. Thank you and good night.